policy changes over the past two decades, especially in Korea, have made it possible for these type of subjects to mm -hmm. finally enter the mainstream. I don't think that was really the case uh, prior to that time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of our book is concerned with looking at the institutional and uh, legislative changes that made it possible for these cultural artifacts to come into to existence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I think there are two things happening. One is the um, government, government itself is really advocating for human rights, especially after the installation of Kim Dae-jung's Kim Dae -jung's administration. It was one of his main agenda. He was a Jimmy Carter of Korea. He wanted to be a <laughs> human <laughs> rights president. Yeah. And he also took up this big project of uh, establishing the National Commission the National Human Rights Commission of Korea, and in in um, accordance of UN policy, and that I think that really shifted the politics. But I think it's not just government; it's not just top down, but also it's bottom up. People demanded it. People mm -hmm. demanded it democracy. And after impeachment of uh, Park Geun Hye, that's when the taxi driver came out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Came out. So we interviewed this uh, program of also uh, human rights film festival. She thinks this is these are not true human rights film because it's just capturing that moment. Yeah. People demanded it, and Park Geun Hye would not have impeached if had people not demanded it. So people accepted this, which means film film corporation actually saw commercial interest here. So they yeah. actually saw oh this could make money because you know millions of people are. Demanding democracy. Oh, democracy is now a commercial subject. So I think this is, I don't know, maybe mixed blessing. I feel ambivalent about taxi driver, the, <laughs> the chasing of taxi driver. Actually, Jang Un did not want to do that chasing and how the suicide bomber like <laughs> taxi driver. <laughs> battling government agent, it's just ridiculous that thing happened. So you have to kind of compromise when you make this big project in Hollywood like film out of this pro-democratic subject, you, you're making action, Hollywood action. In fact, I think it's really remarkable, especially something like Dogani, the silence, they yeah. came out and in the real life, the sex, um, in her, the school, Gwangju in her school, so sex, Sex uh, scandal, sex abuse scandal of children that was exposed, and people demanded it, and then lawmakers quickly responded. And Dogani law was passed within two months of that film release. People petitioned and reopened the case, and people really demanded it. So I think it's quite remarkable the main what mainstream films could do uh, in South Korea that perhaps not the case here in the yeah. United States. I think Dogani is a representative of. Some of the problems of human rights cinema, the fact that you have human rights advocates and champions of human rights or NGO representatives being the heroes as opposed to the the individuals themselves, the young children in this case, who are, you know, who are yeah, yeah. facing disability. They're not the ones who are the heroes necessarily. They're the recipients of the goodwill of the main characters. And I think that's one of the problems we sort of talk about in the book. One of the problems of human rights cinema is that it often supplants doing actual work. <laughs> so, you know, audiences may feel like they've done something really special and having watched, spent 30 minutes of their lives <laughs> watching in the absence, and they pat themselves in the back <laughs> thinking that they're really aware, right? And, and unfortunately, I think that becomes the end point as opposed to the starting point. So, you know, we, we're very conscious of the fact that there are as many problems built into this institutional genre as there are benefits. Obviously, government had a limited power over commercial industry. Yes, you can somehow, you know, you can, government can select certain projects for subsidy. A Korean Film Council can select, but that doesn't mean commercial film industry can do whatever they want. It's a rating system. It's not content mm -hmm. regulation. So content regulation became unconstitutional since 1997. So I think it's really what is the, the main consensus of the popular. That's how film industry responds to. Yes, there somehow government's policy can change and mm -hmm. that affects film content. But just because Park Geun came after, you know, 
no no million that doesn't mean she can dictate certain film I think it's interesting that Moon Jae-in attended a screening in 1987 and he was very moved and he gave an impassioned speech after the screening and he sort of made a connection between what happened then and what was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was drawing, he was underlining the historical continuity um, and the administration it seems to be really aware of the fact that uh, film, uh, that audiences themselves are making that connection. Mm -hmm. I think what Moon Jae-in said that what happened there in 1987 that really changed the people's demands, changed the regime completely, moved to democratization. Mm -hmm. But he said that the task was not finished, but this candlelight movement at that time, which, which basically enabled his administration, coming of his administration, completed task mm -hmm. of 1987. I think that was the probably emotional aspect of that film, and that's why he cried himself yeah. so much. Yeah. One of the things we're arguing is that it's very hard to sort of pinpoint what exactly human rights film is, but we can sort of gesture toward its affect, that is the way that it affects audiences on an emotional level, and gets them thinking about their own government's responsibility or failure to acknowledge um, problems of the past. I think if you use the effective turn in the right way, I mean, there's nothing you couldn't achieve, right? Yeah, it, it can be put to very nefarious uses and it can go the opposite direction, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, um, People getting together in the square. Um, I went to actually, I, I presented this uh, chapter one in the centennial of Korean cinema conference in the fall, um, 2019, uh, that's October. And there was uh, like this rightist movement in Gangnamun Square. These oh, older yeah. people, it was almost like a picnic. <laughs> These uh, older people who are against Moon Jae-in's government, wanted to impeach yeah. Moon Jae-in's government and pro-Trump and anti-Moon Jae-in. I think that's really great that we have this both side and they have a space and this older generation, my parents' generation, who did not have a voice. Yeah. Who could not, like, when they were young, it was impossible to put that way. Um, I think if you want to see political affect in action, go to a human rights film festival. You know, that's where you see, especially in the post-screening Q&A sessions or the conversations that uh, ensue, that's where you'll see that kind of outpouring of emotion. Yeah. And so the institutional parameters of human rights cinema are such that to, to see it in action, you have to go to these venues where people gather together. There's always this question of women minorities when women like there's like 52% of population if in the United States, for example, if somebody is like, this group is 52% of population is that minority. What about black people in South Africa, right? The black people are majority in terms of number, right? And are they minorities? So I think this is always the question, but I would, uh, to me, minorities are power differential, not necessarily number, purely number. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates to political representation as mm -hmm. well as cultural representation. Um, so maybe numbers aren't as important, but yes, when we look at cultural representations, we do want to see some type of correspondence between the actual number right. of immigrant workers or, or migrant workers and their representation on the mm -hmm. screen. And, and if there's a, a discrepancy there, then we should call attention to that. Right. And, and with regard to our incorporation of animal rights, obviously this is a book that's not exclusively about human rights. It's also about non-human rights. And to me, it seems obvious that there is an underlying speciesism that uh, sort of, upon which I think the idea of personhood is predicated. So humanity is the basis of personhood in the human mm -hmm. rights script. What that does, is it excludes millions of other entities and beings from being considered um, uh, deserving of rights. And that's a huge gap. That's a conspicuous absence in the critical literature. And we're trying to sort of not supplant existing literature, but just add to and supplement. Well, I think animal 
uh, we use as a metaphor in Korean cinema a lot, and something like a Kim Ki Duk's film, uh, Address Unknown, Dogs, Abuse Against the Dogs, mm -hmm. Abuse of Dogs. That's a metaphor for how Americans mistreated or how working class uh, Koreans were mistreated. It was a metaphor. There was always metaphor. Animals were misused as a metaphor. I think that's the yeah. metaphor. It's um, the instrumentality of animals. Yeah. They're useful in practical terms, but they're also useful in metaphorical ways. I'm writing a study of human rights cinema more generally, a different mm -hmm. study um, that tries to actually take stock of the textual features of human rights cinema as opposed to the institutional features. I would, maybe I'm wrong in thinking this, but I think that Korean examples of rights advocacy to a certain degree presumes a certain knowledge about historical events. You know, uh, Hesung was referencing in the absence about the civil disaster. Um, that film, yes, it's reached international audiences, but to fully understand the affective dimensions of that film, you sort of need to come into that screening knowing something about Sewol and the governmental mishandling mm. of Sewol. Uh, so if you're an international audience with little to no knowledge, you're, you're going to walk away maybe feeling good about yourself, but you're still not necessarily going to know a great deal about what actually happened. At least the um, more recent <laughs> documentaries I saw, maybe you know, there were some other period that Korean cinema was a little bit more didactic and more education-based. But most recent films are more effective to me, personal mm -hmm. stories, really foreground personal stories or family stories. Maybe, you know, a case study that should bear mentioning here is If You Were Me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're really familiar with the series. It's been going on for several years. It was commissioned by the National Human Rights Commission of Korea. And it's unique because it's an omnibus film or it's a series of omnibus films. And each film is comprised of multiple stories, multiple episodes by different filmmakers, many of whom are really well known. Uh, like I'm thinking Park Kwang Su and um, Park chan Hook and other filmmakers who you know, have made a lot of films. Those films are interesting because they draw equivalencies among disparate subjects. Uh, and in a way, that's what film festivals do. They create these platforms where we're able to see the connections between otherwise disparate subjects. But the centrality of that film series is very unique to Korea. I don't think you can say, yes, omnibus films are made all over the world, and some of them are human rights related. But Korea is really special because that is a film series that was actually commissioned by the National Human Rights Commission of Korea to uh, promote its agenda, to promote its, um, its goals, and to get those films into classrooms. It, ha mm -hmm. it has a very distinctly pedagogical function, but it's pedagogy wedded to affect. A lot of that depends. A lot of that depends on policy and legislation and who's in, who's in charge, who's in power at the time. Uh, but I also think the institutional framework of human rights cinema has to be supported through film festivals, through uh, transnational advocacy groups. And it's unclear at this point if post-COVID, those things that we took for granted a few years ago will still be in existence. If they are, they'll probably be in some other form. Um, the Human Rights Film Festival circuit itself has dramatically changed just this past year as a result of the coronavirus, with so many uh, festivals going online now. Yeah, that yeah. sense of community may still be strong, but it's different it's than, different. say, being co-present with another audience member, other audience members in a screening and being affectively moved by what you're seeing. One thing... Um... One thing kind of uplifting for me when, when I attended their conference, Centennial Conference, um, we talk about how Korean cinema really heyday was 2003. So many good films came out in Memories 2003, of Memories of Murder, <laughs> Boy, and Scandal, and some of uh, Spring, Summer, Fall, Winter, and Spring. And we talk about that. And one, Kim Hong Jun, this um, um, filmmaker, uh, and now he's a He's a professor, Kim Ong Professor Kim said that, well, we are having this renaissance of feminist cinema now, 2019. And there's a lot of right advocacy, women's right advocacy in Korean cinema in 2019. This old film, like female filmmakers, they, like they viewed at the same time, and that uh, Kim Ji Young, 1982, and Hummingbird, 
these great women's films came at the same time, that kind of gave me hope because we don't have that type of a massive movement of women's rights cinema in the United States or in the West in general. Mm -hmm. But all, all women's films came in the same year. I think that suggests something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a Me Too movement, right? But yeah, um, yeah. suggests something, something, some forms this, you know, those, getting together. Those two films, yeah. House of Hummingbird in particular, those have been distributed all over the world. They're part of festivals in London and all over. And I think, uh, now it's not just domestic audiences, but international audiences are expecting something along the same lines in the coming years. They want to see more of them. 